What's up guys, on today's episode, we're gonna be working on my 1995 Chevy Impala. It's gonna be an exciting episode, but at the same time, uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit sad, because I am preparing it to um, you know, move on to the next person. And I've had this car for a very long time, and it's a bit emotional. Uh, you know, I've slept in the back seat when detailing uh, you know, maybe wasn't so great. Um, I've driven it uh, over 200,000 miles and basically, for lack of a better word, lived in it. And, um, you know, I think when you have a kid and you, and you sort of, you know, get older and, and move on, uh, all, of the, all of the, you know, obsession and love with, uh, you know, your car is sort of, not sort of, it just moves over to your son. So any of the cars that I have or would have in the future, I would throw away 50 times over, uh, you know, if, if, if my son needed it. And I'm sure a lot of the dads out there can relate to that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a fun episode, a little bit uh, interesting for me. But anyways, um, getting back to the story, uh, a few weeks ago, we actually had a tornado here in uh, New York, Connecticut area, which is very rare. And what happened was, you know, everything got knocked out. The trees got knocked down, the houses and some, you know, uh, terrible things happened to a lot of good people. So we've been working to try to get everything back in our town. During that time, I've neglected to look at the car and at the roof here of this little um, you know, portable storage thing, it leaked. Uh, there's a bunch of holes, so I patched them up. And water leaked in, so there's a little bit of mold here. The headliner's starting to sag. There's, there's starting to grow mold in the seams here. I mean, just happened really, really fast. Uh, the battery is getting a little low, so I'm gonna change the battery, check the tire pressure, um, and you know, basically uh, disinfect this car, if you will, and uh, get it back to the way that it should be because it deserves better. And then um, moving on to somebody that, uh, who can enjoy it uh, as much as I did for the last, uh, God, 10 years. So uh, anyways, that and a lot more coming up on this episode of Drive and Protect. All the way in. So they, oh, touch up paint on. I can hear it. With the new battery in, I wanted to start the beast and get her warmed up a bit before pulling out of the tent. Come on, baby. While warming up, I check the tire pressure with this ridiculously cool tool, especially if you're a mobile detailer. This is a portable tire inflator I use when I have no access to compressed air, or in this case, the hose simply won't reach that far outside. Set the digital gauge for whatever pressure you want and push the power. It shuts off when the pressure is met. It's great for detailing collections or pulling cars out of storage. After the quick check over, I pulled the Impala out to understand the full extent of the leak. Now, I had driven this car a few weeks prior with no issue and it looked clean, but the storm blew open the front door as well, so it's quite disgusting at the moment. With the car in daylight, step one was to open all the doors and remove everything from the interior. Next, I moved the car closer to the compressor hose and blew out all the storm leaves and junk from the rain rails, which I later discovered was the culprit for the roof leak. It's very common, but nonetheless still annoying. Afterwards, I hopped in the trunk, the very big trunk, to remove my 1000 watt amp from my college days when turning your base up to 11 was a thing, so whatever. Now it was time to remove it so I could pull out the carpet and give it a quick rinse. Next, I removed the hand fasteners that hold the carpet in place. I pulled the fabric out and I laid it in the sun while I worked on emptying the rest of the car into clear plastic baggies I use when I'm doing a regular customer detail. It helps the owner see what's inside and if they want to keep it or chuck it out. Now, for the record, I never clean out any armrest of any customer car, obviously other than my own, because there's too much liability from lost items from the owners who may have genuinely believed that item, you know, X was in there, but it really wasn't. Then they ask you, hey, did you move it? And so on. So you can avoid this headache altogether, or you can simply get written permission to go into the armrest and glove boxes to save yourself confusion down the road. Now, I know this sounds a little bit ridiculous and crazy, but having the conversation with the customer at the very least motivates them to take a quick peek in the armrest and if they want to clean it out or not and if they give you permission great and honestly not one customer has ever given me pushback about my rule so keep that in mind for your business step two is to clean up the engine now let's be real this is an lt1 that has 230,000 original miles in 23 years so it's not new but it can definitely use a healthy bath so i applied plastic bags over the alternator and the computer system to avoid any potential issues Next, I filled up a small bucket with Ammo Brute wheel soap and my wheel cleaning tools. Then I applied Ammo Plum wheel cleaner to the dry, cool engine. Notice how some of the parts are really starting to come clean on the first step. 
After a minute or two, and before plum dried, I added brute to the engine with the aerator to get into those tight spots. I then spent a few minutes agitating the cleaners with a wheel brush and then rinsed it down before it could dry completely. Afterwards, I used compressed air to remove any remaining puddles and remove the plastics before immediately starting the engine and checking for any possible issues. Now remember, I'd been driving this car for the last 23 years, so any weird sounds would be easy to notice, but luckily, all was good to go. Now it was time to focus on step three, which is mold removal. So, with mold here, the first thing people think is, oh, let's steam clean it. Now, in theory, that makes sense, but uh, in being practical from a safety perspective, as you're steaming mold, basically what you're doing is you're putting the, the mold spores into vapor into the air and you're breathing that in, hence the whole mask thing. Um, and take it pretty seriously. You can um, you know, get some bad allergic reactions and sneezing and all that kind of stuff. So just put a mask on and you save the whole thing, put some glasses on too. So normally this is plastic leather or vinyl, right? Plastic leather or vinyl, we use uh, ammo lather. In this case, I'm not gonna use lather. I'm gonna use ammo shag. Now shag has some, and that's for the, the fabric, as you guys know, the carpet, Alcantara, that sort of thing. It has hydrogen peroxide in it, so it's, a, it's got a bit more bite to it. In this case, we want as much bite as, as possible. And then we're gonna do uh, a few other steps after that. So I guess the moral of the story here is I'm addressing the issues first, the mold, uh, the uh, headliner is gonna be next and kind of, figured those out first, then we're gonna go in and, and clean it up. And now most people are gonna think, hey, let's go and shampoo the carpets. The idea here is to minimize the amount of water possible. So we're gonna shag the carpets, scrub them, and, and blot them dry. Now, if they need afterwards, I'm looking at maybe tomorrow and I go, you know what, everything's dry, looks like the mold is gone, and then you wanna shampoo, by all means do it. But when you're in a kind of a moist, environment and you're having issues with mold for sure you don't want to like blast lots of water at it what it does is just spreads it around sort of like you know maybe a throw up or, or dog poo or blood or something you don't just instantly hit it you want to blot it and pick it up in this case you can't really blot it and pick it up if, you, if you're with me here but you don't want to steam it you don't want to put tons of water on it you don't, you don't want to spread it around because this is pretty serious so um first thing i'm going to do is obviously put your mask on uh, and some glasses notice i have a plastic bag here once I'm done with this, this is a really dirty look, messed up kind of towel. I found a junky towel. It goes right into the, uh, into the plastic bag and it gets thrown away. Don't mess with mold, it's not worth it. Same thing with the scrub pad. Sorry guys, it's uh, 10 bucks or whatever. And this one I've had for you know five years or something. It's going in the garbage. So the first step is we're gonna take shag. Now shag normally, like I said, goes on car carpet fabric, Alcantara. We're gonna put it on here. And I'm not gonna go too, too crazy because I don't want it to spread. All right, I'm gonna go in, let that sit for a second, put it on uh, the scrub pad, scrub it. Well, you can actually see the mold, um, mold spores coming up right now. Matter of fact, what I'm gonna do is pull the camera in and show you real time. Look at that, look at those mold spores right there. Do you see them right there, the little things, the little black things? Watch, I'll move them with my finger. See they're moving? That's the stuff you wanna be careful of. Okay, so we're gonna hit it again. Light, little scrub, see that brown spot right there? That's mold, that's why you don't wanna introduce it back into the car again. A lot of times what I'll do while I'm using this, is I'll spray it right here. And just try to get as much out as you can while I'm still using this. Okay, mold all in here, see the little dots here? Just a little bit, go back in, scrub it down. Hmm. Kind of gross. And then go back in and pick it up. Keep track of where you are in your towel. I've only worked on one side so far, so you don't reintroduce uh, nasty mold. Once I'm done, once I finish all of this here, because it really wasn't too much. You could see it just dripped down from the, that's where it's, you know, the ceiling's a little dirty too. As I'm taking uh, isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, now I've diluted this already, so it looks like it's you know in the can in the bottle. But if you squeeze really hard, you can actually get the top off. So I put some water in there, and with all these rubber seals and things, I don't like to go too too nuts. But I take it, spray it on the towel, and I just like to do a light, really kind of final wipe. So that's a quick uh, way of um, you know getting mold out and being relatively confident. Again, we have more steps to do, but that's the first thing I wanted to focus on. A uh, little piecemeal. And then in a few minutes, we're going to power wash the car down. I can only fathom what's going to come off then. 
Now, I can already imagine the YouTube comments of using light ISO on the interior, but I know my interior and I know my color, and I knew it would be able to handle it. But if you feel uncomfortable, do not do this step. At minimum, do a test spot first if you're feeling a little weird. Now, as you guys know, I'm cautious about everything I do in my car. However, with mold and bacteria, I'll always push the limits of the material safety in pursuit of my own personal safety and health. Finding that right balance, of course, is the goal. But again, to each his own. For step four, let's focus on removing the water stain from the old, sensitive headliner. Lightly spray ammo shag on the headliner, but avoid over soaking. Less is more for headliners. Next, agitate with an interior brush or lightly with a scrub pad, bringing the water drip stain to the surface of the fabric, then wipe dry with a microfiber towel and repeat as necessary. The drip of water also hit the carpet, as you can see here. Again, ammo shag and the scrub pad agitated the stain and the microfiber towel picked it up. While I was in this carpet mode, I decided to clean all of the carpet in case a light layer of mold was present. To do this, use a light mist of shag and a red handle brush. The goal is to minimize the amount of water used, especially during the mold eradication phase. If you still happen to have one of those old DA porter cables lying around, throw a scrub brush on it for some deep carpet cleaning. It saves your shoulder and arms from blowing out, and it's oddly satisfying. I'll post a link in the description below of where I got mine. Afterwards, I quickly vacuumed to promote fast drying and to pick up anything the scrub brush brought to the surface of the carpet. Step five was to clean the rest of the interior plastics, leather, vinyl, and Alcantara in a normal fashion as you would on a non-moldy interior. For example, lather for the cup holders, dashboards, steering wheels, doors, and so on, and shag for the carpet and the Alcantara inserts. Click the video link above to watch the process of how and why they were sewn into each seat. Step six is to address the now peeling headliner from the small leak. First, I added masking tape to the glass to help catch any adhesive overspray. I'm using 3M's headliner and fabric adhesive for 12 to 15 bucks found at any auto parts store. Add an even layer of adhesive on the foam and evenly wipe the headliner with a credit card or a squeegee to avoid wrinkles or creases. When you're all done, obviously it's not going to look brand new, but it does look much better now. For step seven, I added baking soda to the fabric to ensure any moisture from the leak and my light carpet cleaning was removed. I sprinkled some on the floors and allowed it to sit overnight. We will address this tomorrow morning, but for now, it's time for a very heavy wash. Step eight is pretty simple. Power wash the heck out of the car. Get into all the seams and blow out the junk. Now that the leaves are not clogging the rain channels, it didn't leak after the heavy wash with the power washer, so clearly this was my culprit. It's not very surprising, it's sort of a common issue on these cars. After the heavy pre-rinse, I focused on the wheels using Ammo Plum and Brute, along with a small wheel woolly, lug nut brush, and eventually the wheel wash mitt. The wheels are also painted with this rail matte finish, so this is as shiny as they're going to get. Just a heads up if you're wondering why they're not bling bling shiny at this point. Now it's every adult's favorite time, and probably kid's nightmare, it's bath time. As most of you know, I don't usually foam an entire car because they usually don't require it, and I don't want to waste the product. Obviously, if there ever was a time to foam down a car, this would be the one for sure. Instead of using ammo foam, I instead used ammo brute wheel soap in the foam gun because it's stronger and it'll chew up the caked on gunk. After a minute or so of sitting, I then agitated the paint with an old wash towel that would not be used on any future cars. Next, I heavily power washed the soap off again, looking closely for any missed spots. Next, I quickly dried the matte finish with ammo hydrate and a microfiber towel. Now check out the hood in this unplanned 50-50 shot, if you will. Notice how the water on the passenger side makes the matte finish look glossy until I dry it later. This is the peaks and valleys of the matte paint filling up with water, overflowing, and then bouncing the light similar to regular paint. It's kind of cool to see it on film. That's why your paint always looks deeper, richer, or shinier when it's wet. The thin layer of water creates a more smooth, reflective surface than, say, a dry, contaminated, scratched surface, or in this case, a matte finish. After drying the car, I decided to spray the rear liner fabric with Ammo Brute as well for two reasons. One, the liner was so stained that it couldn't possibly get any worse after 23 years. And two, it was already in my foam gun. So with the carpet covered in brute, I scrubbed it with a red handle brush. 
And for those of you wondering and leaving YouTube comments, I'm listening to Pandora. It's either the Bill Burr Comedy Channel or Raids Against the Machine Channel. Now, FYI, this poster has been behind my desk in my office since 2005. I love Rage Against the Machine. Zach, if you're listening, come back to the band. They need you. Then I moved it into the sun to dry while I worked on the door jams. Now, normally I would simply wipe the jams with a towel because they're usually not that bad and the small amount of overspray from the water and the hose would be enough to lubricate the towel, but obviously not the case here. So instead I used Ammo Frothy and the aerator because of the absurd amount of dirt that seeped into every jam in the past few weeks of rain. Bright and early the next morning for step nine, I called in some reinforcements. Okay guys, at this point, uh, we left the baking soda overnight, came in, vacuumed it. I'm very confident that the mold uh, was removed yesterday. So everything was dry and great. Now, luckily, uh, my buddy Dan was driving around. He was local, and uh, we got to use his hot water extractor. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, let's clean the interior as if it was a normal detail, meaning it didn't have any mold. Normally, you don't want to introduce more water when mold is involved. But if you're confident the mold is gone, as I was in this case, then it's a good idea to, to uh, you know, hot water extract it and it looks fantastic. So we did all of that, now we're gonna let it dry. While we're letting it dry, as you can see here, you know, years ago the car was painted in uh, this coating called rail, sort of similar to Plasti Dip. And over time on these horizontal panels, the hood, the roof, and the trunk, um, they really started to fade clearly from the sun. Now the, the vertical sides are pretty good, uh, but uh, the top is, is quite bad. So last night I was playing on the trunk and I took a little bit of Plasti Dip and I did about uh, you know half the area to see a 50-50 shot and it was significantly better. So basically I'm putting Plasti Dip on top of rail, but it's not as if I'm Plasti Dipping the entire car because that would take lots of cans and lots of time. This is um, sort of refreshing it, but putting a nice light coat on there and you'll see immediately it just brings out that matte uh, paint. So. To do that, uh, it, this is boiling hot in the sun. We're gonna pull it uh, over there in the shade and then Dan and I are each gonna take a side and just kinda lightly refresh it and you'll see a, a huge difference. As you can clearly see, after a few passes, the difference from before and after is wildly significant. What's nice is that we didn't have to go through 20 cans or whatever because we were just refreshing the current layer of rail. Truthfully, I had not planned this at all before the shoot, but the horizontal surfaces look so horrible and so different from the doors that I took a chance and I was pleased with the results. In total, we used about three cans to touch up the coating, and once we were done, Dan pulled the Impala back into the sun to dry and for us to look for any uneven surfaces or blending that may need to be touched up again. If you're watching the process closely and you're wondering why we didn't mask anything off, it's because the entire car, including the trim, is covered in the matte finish, except the glass. So, instead of spending 30 minutes carefully masking off the glass, for step 11, we simply used the razor blade to clean the surface during our normal glass cleaning steps. To super clean your glass, spray the surface with whatever window cleaner you have, and use the cleaner as lubrication for your razor blade extension tool. Hold it at roughly a 45 degree angle or so to the glass and glide it across the surface until the razor becomes full of the contaminants, sort of a similar idea to shaving your face. Next, Dan and I attack the dingy exhaust tips with metal polishing paste and 4 aught steel wool. Once done, we wiped it with a clean microfiber towel. Keep in mind the exhaust tips can be polished to a shinier finish with a 3 inch machine and M105 and 205, however because the entire car is a matte finish I wanted the exhaust to be clean but not reflective as it wouldn't fit the matte look so I stopped here. For step 12 I reinstalled the cleaner but not perfect trunk liner and then grabbed the ozone machine for a quick blast. For this to be effective, at least one window needs to be down to draw in fresh air. Now, there are fancy window conversion units as well that are more efficient, but a three or four inch gap in the window will do the trick in a pinch. This machine will create O3 to shock the odors I couldn't reach behind the panels, under the seats, and cushions, and so on. It's best to leave the AC running with Recirculate On, which this car does not have, for at least 30 minutes to kill the bacteria in the HVA system as well. Obviously, nothing alive should be in the car when you're using an ozone machine as O3 is harmful to plants and animals. After 45 minutes or so, pull the machine out, but close all the windows and let the O3 sit in the sun for 30 minutes undisturbed. However, before you go back in the car full time, open up all the doors and let it fully air out and convert back into O2 for a few minutes and you should be good to go. If you find your car still smells and you need another blast, that's fine. Just do it in 30 minute increments. 
Now, the last step, of course, is to take pictures for my post, but I would need to go for a quick goodbye spin around the block. Listen to the LT-1 with Flowmasters. This thing still sounds like a beast. Before the pitcher, I added a bit of ammo mud to the tires while Dan was wetting the ground to help the reflection in the pitcher. When all was said and done, my Impala looked as good as the day I bought it 15 years earlier. Well guys, we're all set and the car looks amazing. Uh, putting a light layer of Plasti Dip on top of the rail coating really made it pop out. Um, now, of course, this is a little bit of a bittersweet moment for me. I've uh, spent a lot of time in this car. I've had it since 2003 and I put 230,000 miles on it and it started for me every day. It doesn't owe me a dime. Um, so I'm excited that we cleaned it up and um, you know, a little sad that it's gonna go to somebody else, but I think at the same time, it's exciting. I uh, hopefully enjoy, somebody enjoys it as much as I do. Now I've had this car um, all the way up until I had the Ford Edge, the first one, the silver one. So it's been uh, a, a large part of my driving life has been in this car. So anyways, uh, hope you guys enjoy the video. Um, if you see my car on the road, say hi. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.